Hello, Living Word Life Groups. Welcome back. It's another month, the month of September. I get to share the table with my, my good friend, Pastor Tim, who, so we're filming this in August. And so, Pastor Tim, I know you, yesterday, you and your wife celebrated your anniversary. Yes, 48 years of marital bliss. Incredible. <laughs> It's been a good run. It's been maybe she'll keep me around. That's you know, right. I, I think I may have the Lord will sustain her. Yes. <laughs> uh, well, and then it's we're moving into the month of September. I know because I know Pastor Tim that he is excited just like me. That means football season's happening, and that means our LSU Tigers. September first, baby. Oh yeah, yeah, our LSU Tigers are likely undefeated. And on their way to the national championship, as you're watching this now. There you go. So, well, this week we're we're diving in to um, back into our series in First John, and it's been so rich. And so the the sermon we're diving into on this particular month is was titled "The Urgent Need for Discernment." And in the sermon, Ben he he Pastor Ben he really dives into just the need for the believer to test everything according to the Word of God. And so he talks about how believers, uh, all people, but even believers, like that we can be deceived and that we can, if we're not careful, we can slowly adopt the value system of the world and the beliefs of the world. And that the believer in the life of the believer, you know, we're, we need to have discernment. And uh, in the point, discernment is a major thing that Ben is talking about. So my question to, to you, Brother Tim, is... You know, what exactly is discernment, like Christian discernment, and how does the believer go about acquiring it or developing it? That's a great question, Brian. Um, a synonym for discernment might be judgment, sound judgment, or evaluation. And I think Paul hits the nail on the head in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and I'm going to get you, Brian, if you don't mind, to read. We're going to read from the CSB because it makes it really clear. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 14 through 16. So here it is. But the person without the Spirit does not receive what comes from God's Spirit because it is foolishness to him. He is not able to understand it since it is evaluated spiritually. The spiritual person, however can evaluate everything, and yet he himself cannot be evalu evaluated by anyone. For who has known the Lord's mind that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. A couple of things in that passage of Scripture I think that are, are key. Uh, the first one is that the natural man, another translation says, does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. Why? Because they're spiritually discerned or spiritually, CSB would say, evaluated. Uh, the passage that Pastor Ben preached on was that we ought to test the Spirit. We ought to test the spirits. And so when we listen or um, we're exposed to ideas out there, We've got to evaluate those. We've got to judge those. We've got to discern those. But look at the little phrase at the end of verse 16. It says, but we have the mind of Christ. So you might be wondering, how do I get the mind of Christ? Why would Paul say that? Every believer can have the mind of Christ if they fill their minds and saturate their lives with the Word of God. So, you know, Brian, you know this is my thing. A discipleship guy, uh, I'm always encouraging people, hey, listen, get into the Word of God until the Word of God gets into you. And when you fill your mind with the Word of God, you can better discern or test whether or not something comes from God. Yeah. So uh, if, if it's coming from the world, we need to disregard it. But if it comes from God, we need to embrace it. Yeah, I love it. I and, and where it gets tricky is every one of Satan's lies, as Ben told us in his sermon, 
has an element of truth mm-hmm. to it. So at first it might you it might look like, hey, this looks really good. Yeah. But really, as you pray over it, as you discern, as you evaluate, does it really line up with Scripture? Right. So things can appear to be really good until you look at the whole counsel yeah. of God. That's why it's so important to fill your mind with God's Word. Yeah, as you're, as you're saying that, one of the places that just stands out that you see that in Scripture is when Jesus is uh, in the wilderness for 40 days. You know, Satan tempts when Satan tempts him. He's using uh, he's using Bible concepts and he's he's twisting them. And Jesus comes combats it with the Bible truth. And it's this: Hey, Jesus knows the Word of God. And so, does Jesus know the Word of God because He is God, or does Jesus know the Word of God because He's a man who's like applied Himself? And you know, I believe that Jesus has studied the Scriptures. I mean, He is yes. God, but He has yes. studied the Scriptures. And it's he has grown in stature. Yeah, and he still had to memorize God's word just like every Jewish boy correct. did. And even though he was God, even though he was the living word, yeah. the one who was alive. It's a mind uh, bender. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. That's Jesus, yeah. right? So we know that from John's writings already. Uh, but he had to do the hard work of committing the scripture to memory like we ought to be doing. Yeah, I know you've challenged me in that area of, of um, scripture memory, um, prayer life, Bible study. Um, and it's really been it's really been good. And I know that in my personal life, that whatever I'm feeding on, and a lot of times it's coming through um, my social media or my podcasts and things of that nature. Like if I'm if I'm feeding on a lot of exercise and diet content, it bleeds out of my life. I want to exercise. I want to eat healthy. And whatever I'm feeding on it, like. It does, it like oozes out of me. Mm-hmm. And so I know that it's this mind of Christ. It's like when we're feeding on the word of God consistently and it dominates your mind, it's going to ooze out of you just the same. And, it's, and it sharpens you up. And you can, uh, you know, a lot of times uh, an example people hear is about the the, the counterfeit money. You know, how do, the, how do the, the FBI, whoever, how do they identify the counterfeit money? They don't study the fake money. They study the real money. And then when the fake money shows up, they know it ain't the real thing. And it's the same with us. It's like as we In a similar way, yeah. Similar when way. when when lies come, because we know the real thing you so well, out. then red flags go up. Correct. You know, I, that's what I think of. I yeah. think of a red flag. Hey, this yeah. is this is uh, out of bounds. Yeah. This isn't God's word. And the, and then the beauty is that the one we're studying, our God. He wants to be in relationship with us. He wants to. He wants to be part. He's like he's, you know, he's not going to leave you out to dry. He is going to guide you. He's going to help you, and it's inc- and you can trust in that and lean on that, and it's awesome. Yes, so, mindset is so important. Yeah. Well, life groups. Uh, I'm gonna turn you to the point. Uh, enjoy your time, and uh, thank you for gathering. Therefore, the call is to not be deceived. False prophets are everywhere. Lies are everywhere. Test everything. Don't be deceived. The church must be, lean in here, I'm almost done. The church must be the voice of righteousness in the culture. We must speak to the obvious evil in our society. Obvious immorality must be spoken about. The church cannot go along like everything is okay with the world and just preach unhelpful self-help messages. The church cannot sleepwalk through this critical time. And listen, here's what's true. You see it all over, don't you? Today we are seeing those who would call themselves non-religious recognizing that something is terribly wrong in our country. And we must be the ones who explain what is wrong and how people can be set free from sin. We must point to the biblical worldview concerning humanity we must call sin, sin, evil, evil. We must talk. We, we must not just talk about righteousness. We must walk in righteousness. We must preach with compassion. But we must preach the gospel without apologies. And here's why. Because it honors the Lord. It's what he deserves. But also because there will come a day when the powers that be will seek to silence the church. 
And the question will be, will we stand or will we bow? God has called us to this time. Not to blend in and go along, but to stand up and stand out. Because I'm convinced the world needs Jesus. They're de- they're, they're delu- those apart from Christ are living in a delusion. They need Jesus. And we are called to give them Jesus. Matthew 5, you are the light of the world. A city set on the hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In that same way, my beloved Beloved, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. That's our call. I love what one commentator says about this. He says, I think that in many places in the West, God has become smaller in his church's estimation as well as in the culture. We doubt his power. We doubt his control. We doubt his ability to grow his kingdom by bringing people to faith. We grow angry or fearful as though the forces of modern secularism might overcome the creator God or cause an end of his church. And so we grow quiet or silent in our evangelism. The call is not to go that route. The call is to stand up as the city on the hill, as the light on the hill. The call is to not believe every spirit, to walk in discernment, to not compromise the message but to compassionately and boldly hold high the truth of God's word. Accommodation, my brothers and sisters, does not transform lives, but a clear, bold, compassionate gospel message gets the job done. As Pastor Daniel read, the word of the cross, for the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. To those who are being saved, it is the power of God. Where's the one who is wise? Where's the scribe? Where's the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through its own wisdom, men of Athens, but it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but what do we do? We preach Christ crucified. We stay spiritually sharp in order for us to stay on mission. So the Baltimore teacher was eventually arrested at the Baltimore Washington International Airport while attempting to board a flight to Houston and he got caught with guns in his bag. Don't people know you can't get away with that? There's actually metal detectors you gotta go through. I don't understand that. What do people think they can get away with that? But he was stopped for packing a gun in his bags. Officers discovered he had a warrant for his arrest. And those who've been studying the impact of AI commented on this story. And this is what they, these are are the questions they're asking. What is going to be the consequence of this? This is April 26, 2024. What's going to be the consequence of this? Here's another question. At what point... Or we're going to wake up as a country and say, why are we allowing this? Listen to this one. Here's another question. Where are the regulators? Where are the regulators? Oh, oh, wait, 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 wait. We're secular. We're pluralistic. We're relativistic. We can't have regulators. Where are the regulators? Ah, we want regulation now. Artificial intelligence scams are the perfect representation of what we've become as a culture. We don't want to embrace truth, God's truth, so we're left with our own versions of reality. And then it becomes difficult to discern between what is real and what is not, what is true and what is false. Apostle Paul, he prays in Colossians that we would not be deluded by plausible arguments. How do you avoid being deluded by plausible arguments, by deep fakes? How do you avoid being deluded by plausible arguments? How do we stop believing every spirit? You know, there are three main stones used during the building process. There's the capstone, the keystone, and the cornerstone. You, do, do you know that? How many builders, mason workers we have here? The capstone, the keystone, the cornerstone. The capstone is designed to throw water off the masonry wall to help prevent damage to the wall. The keystone 
is a wedge-shaped stone at the center of a masonry arch to evenly distribute the weight of the masonry down the sides of the arch. The cornerstone was the first stone, is the first stone set in place at the center of a masonry arch or a building, the cornerstone, to evenly distribute the weight, to, to carefully put measurements. The, the, the cornerstone was the first stone set during the building process. To care, careful measurements were taken to ensure the cornerstone was square, right? That's a cornerstone, to ensure proper alignment of the remainder of the building. So how do we avoid being deluded by possible arguments? The cornerstone ensures proper alignment for the rest of the building. And so it is in our life. If we will stop believing every spirit, if we will not be deceived by the subtle lies of the culture, if our life will be properly aligned to truth, we must keep our eyes fixed on the cornerstone who is Christ. We must keep our eyes fixed on his word, which is a cornerstone that aligns our life to what is true. So my brothers and sisters, and many false prophets have gone out in the world today, many lies. My heart for you and for me and for my family, for my kids, is that we would not be deceived. That we as Christians would not lose our witness because we are deluded by plausible arguments. May we keep our eyes fixed on the cornerstone who is Christ. May we keep our eyes fixed on the cornerstone that aligns our life according to truth and what is right and what is good and what God designed and what he requires. May we keep our eyes fixed on the cornerstone which is his word. May we keep our eyes fixed on Christ. Father, we thank you for your word here today. I thank you, God for your word that warns us, helps us to stay sharp, to stay awake, to stay vigilant, to keep our eyes fixed on the cornerstone who is Christ. And God, may we stop believing, may we stop believing every spirit. May we guard the hearts of our lives and of our kids and our families. God, may we not go down the slippery slope of the cultural deceptions that are all around us. May we stay awake, stay alert, and we keep our eyes fixed on Christ, who is our anchor and who is our hope. And Lord, and may we stay on mission to point others to the chief cornerstone. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, welcome back, Life Groups. Uh, I want to thank Pastor Tim for joining me today. Uh, I want to bring two things to your attention before we start the questions. Uh, the first thing is that, you know, this is the September life group. So all through the month of September, our church is kind of doing, a, in my opinion, a new thing. And on Sunday nights, I don't know when y'all are meeting particularly, but on Sunday nights, starting on September the 8th, every Sunday night at 530, uh, we're doing a, a, a marriage, uh, like a marriage sermon. Uh, and so I, I, I just in encourage you to come out to that. It's going to be um, enriching. It's going to be good. Invite your friends. It's open to everybody. You know, it's not just a living word thing. It's open to everybody. And I know it's going to be a good time. Uh, and, and it's going to be important. It's going to be, it's going to be something that builds your marriage and uh, just grows you closer together and uh, grows you closer to the Lord. The other thing I want to bring to your attention is, you know, this is the month of September. That means October's on the horizon. October has the pumpkin patch, which is our biggest event, biggest outreach of the year. And so I just encourage you, be bold uh, as life groups. I would encourage you to sign up as a group. And uh, when the when those volunteer pages hit the uh, table in the front foyer, uh, be engaged, sign up, because it helps Pastor Vern and Tina to know, um, how, it helps them gauge the volunteers, it helps them gauge where they need to, to be fitting people in. So be bold. Uh, Come out as a group, uh, be engaged, be prayerful about it. Because really, you know, it's an event, but it's an outreach. You know, we're not we're not just selling pumpkins here. Like we're doing something much bigger than that. So I encourage you at the end of your life group, be intentional about praying for the pumpkin patch uh, as you gather. But then moving forward in your own life, be intentional about praying about the pumpkin patch and praying about the impact it has. You know, our pumpkin patch it impacts our local community. But it really it impacts the world. The money the money that is raised is sent out. 
It is sent out. So let's be let's be committed as life groups to be prayerful about that. Um, and so I, I think it's going to be awesome. I love the pumpkin patch. Uh, I do too. So well, life groups, you know, life group leaders, thank you for opening up your home. Thank you all for gathering together. Um, I encourage you to be uh, when you're doing the questions, just be be open. You know, this is a, this is a, a time and a space to really press in and be transparent with one another and just to support each other and uh, be be prayerful for the pumpkin patch. Pray for one another. We love you and we thank you. Have a good night. Bye. Bye.